In this episode, I get to talk with Todd Geist and John Renfrew, who's one of my favorite repeat guests, and we talk about OData coming to the Claris platform and why that matters. Todd, John, thanks for joining us. So with 19.5 just having come out, there's a pretty big conversation to have around OData. Um, can we just start off by talking about what OData even is? Yes. So first of all, it's a new thing to everybody who has just got the 19.5 Windows and Mac server version. If you've had the Linux version running for any of the last year, you have at least had a chance to find out something about what this is about. Isn't it also in cloud? It's also in cloud as well, because yeah. cloud is the Linux cloud is the Linux server. We can talk about there's a little bit of extra complexity about what that implies, which makes it not quite so easy to use on some levels. Um, the simple version of it is uh, it's it does the it does the sort of job that the data API does. You can query your FileMaker data using a REST methodology using insert from URL and get some kind of answer back in JSON. So then, obviously, the question is, well, why do you need two things then? And that's where you get to some of the really high level interesting differences between the data API and OData. The big thing on the data API is you have a username and a password and you log on to the data API and what you get back is a token that you can then use. And therefore you have to store and manage that token. Now, if that's totally in FileMaker, you can put it in a global variable, put it in a global field, that's fine. If you're on a website, you're writing a website, you got to handle that in a cookie or some methodology somewhere. Um, and that token, if you don't use it for 15 minutes, I think it is, it dies. Um, and it keeps the session open for all of the time you have the token. So if you only log on, get an answer, good practice would be you then go and get rid of the token. So OData, in comparison, one of the, the things about how it works is it's basic authentication. Every call is just a simple username and password, basic auth. That's one of the biggest differences in use uh, for, for kind of what, what people are going to see. Um, ultimately, it's a different bit of technology. The Data API is FileMaker's own version of a RESTful version of your FileMaker data. OData is something independent. It was invented by Microsoft as a piece of technology. Um, so it provides a standard way of doing a series of jobs that are essentially documented outside of FileMaker, outside of Claris, and they have just employed that. So in the same way that execute, S, execute SQL as a function, um, if you know SQL 92, you know how to write the query that's based, on, based inside it. Because essentially, that knowledge isn't invented by Claris. It's been hooked into something which pre-exists. So OData is hooking into a, something that's been invented by somebody else to deliver your data to you. What OData is... Stop me if you're bored, or if you want to ask questions, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I do, what I, so OData uses REST technologies, queries using insert from URL to, to a URL string. But everything else about what you're trying to query uh, goes after the question mark. So it's a parameter in the URL string. So that's how you modify what you're looking for or what you can get back. Um, so it's a kind of SQL meets ODBC, but it's all done using web technologies and all the query stuff is in the string of the URL. If you, that's, the, that's the big thing to grasp. 
Whereas the data API says, do this query. Oh, and the thing I'm looking for is a JSON object in the body I've sent you. Whereas in OData, you put whatever query, find this record or these records is in the URL string. Um, everything else about it is just a simple uh, insert from URL. Might be useful just to step back and up a little bit around what OData is in the rest of the world. It, 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 is, it is Microsoft's attempt to webify ODBC is one way to look at it. So in fact, yes. ODBC is not on cloud and not on Linux uh, for, for the FileMaker server and OData is its replacement. ODBC still is on the Mac and Windows versions of server but um, ODAT is really a, a modern take on that. Now, you know, in the rest of the development world or programming world, there's various takes on whether or not it's a successful re, re, redo of ODBC. But ODBC had lots of problems. Uh, and some of them have to do with the fact that you need these driver things. You need these ODBC drivers to be yeah. installed on the servers and, and on the devices. Um, and they would open up and maintain these things called connection pools to the database. Um, and all of this got to be really problematic as things move to the web. One of the ways in which this shows up is if you're, if you're using serverless technologies like Lambda functions, those functions don't live very long. The, the, the server, the little, the little engine that's running those code, that code, um, may only last for, a, may only be running for a few seconds which means that any ODBC type connection that you would have been able to open to a database um, would close. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and, and every function, every, uh, every function that gets spun up you know, and sort of as, as the serverless infrastructure allows you to scale out these calls horizontally would make its own database connection and use up slots in the, in the database to do that. And, and that was why we had these things called connection pools. So there were, there, um, all of that goes away with OData because OData is simply using HTTP. So OData is one way to think about it is it's ODBC over HTTP. That's maybe a too broad a generalization, but it kind of fits for us in what we're, in what we're thinking about, uh, in terms of the FileMaker ecosystem, um, is that it gives you those benefits, uh, without having to have this, this database, uh, this DSN or this data data source name, this this driver thing that we had to put on the servers or on the clients that, that were using it. And this was invented by Microsoft and Microsoft uses it uh, for their graph API. So the newer versions of all of Microsoft's APIs um, are all what they call the Microsoft graph and they're all OData. So that gets to John's point about this technology being outside of FileMaker and defined by somebody else and used by lots of people. Uh, and this is just something that they, that they chose to implement as opposed to invent. So I think that was worth saying uh, as we dive into the, some of the details, the differences between uh, the data API and OData. That's why it exists. And it's better in the long run than ODBC. Or equally SQL, similar thing, similar issue about yeah. drivers. Yeah. Um, and for FileMaker use, it keeps all of the authentication of letting you into your data inside the FileMaker box. It's a new privilege set. So you can have a username and a password that is only allowed to talk to your database using OData and can be as limited as any other privilege set can be by you can't do this and you can't do this and you can't run this script. And so for Claris FileMaker developers, all of that stuff is in our control in terms right. of who gets who gets to access it. So, and it's, like I say, it's just like how you would consider any other piece of access. Um, that, that's another issue with ODBC because the username and the password is hidden in the driver and you've got to go to the machine and right. change the DSM. One of the questions that just popped into my mind is because you're, ma you're actually authenticating on each request with basic auth, that implies that the server is not maintaining a session open like it does 
with the data API, right? The data API, you can do globals and things like that. And they actually, they actually stick between connections as long as your session has not, has not expired. What's the story with, with OData? Is there a session maintained in some other way or is there no session? Is there no server session? Uh, there's well, there's no there's no reusable server session. Even if the connection is held for a short while, you don't get access to the previous connection because every single call has to just has to have the basic auth uh, in yeah. it. So so it's of no value. Whereas right. the token based thing, you can have a session which, as long as the token is alive, you can reuse them parts from it so uh, in in practical terms well no it's not session based it's literally call based yeah so that might have an impact on performance because each each data api connection is open for 15 minutes and it, it reserves resources on the server while it's doing that um and that so you know on a very active system with lots of with lots of connections to the data API, you actually you actually do run into situations where there's too many of them. Um, and I don't, it sounds like with OData that that may not be the case because there's nothing to, there's, there's nothing for the server to hold on to. So I, I'm gonna, I haven't fully done lots of load-based testing on it. Um, I am going to be speaking on this topic uh, in the upcoming All to Enter Live conference so I promise I will have done some research before then and be able to answer <laughs> Good, that, that, that question a little more. So there's 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 a question to do some research with. Um, the other uses, so we we'll, we need to talk about kind of the in-house uses, but um, the kind of peripheral uses are that if you're on Windows, unfortunately only Windows, and you use Excel, then your FileMaker data can be accessed through OData. So we know that in Excel, you can set up an ODBC connection. Well, you can also set up an OData connection to live FileMaker data in Excel. Um, you just need the username and password. Really, that's a kind of side thought. But for people where that is an appropriate way to be able to grab a bit of data and do a quick local graph, absolute, I've tested it, absolutely works whether or not it's big enough for big production. Um, other, particularly Microsoft-based, but things like BI tools uh, can set up um, connections. Uh, I know it works in Click as well. I think Tableau can do it. That you just So effectively, like Todd says, it's just a source of data somewhere, but it doesn't need all this driver stuff. It just needs to know What's the URL? Um, what's the table name? What's the username? What's the password? Off you go. Thank you very much. Whenever you do connect through OData, what are you accessing? Are you is it layout based? Because the data API is very layout driven, correct? Correct. That is a great question, Martha. Next on my list to answer, because that's another massive difference. The data API needs layouts, named layouts, and whatever you put on the layout is returned by the query using the data API. So that's a way to manage what you get back. You have a, you have a table with 800 fields, you put five fields on a layout, you only get the five fields back. The problem is you have to go off and build lots of layouts and manage layouts, schema items, just for the purpose of getting data back from the outside, remember. so. OData is completely different because it works at the table level. So in the same way as a SQL query is not based, so inside FileMaker, a SQL query is not is just based on the table occurrence name and the field name. Similar kind of thing here. You, you are literally just talking to this server, this file, and potentially this table and therefore all of that table is accessible to you. So you have to learn how to not return 800 fields to you by modifying the request. But essentially, it, and, and so for, for it to use the, any of those external things, Excel, websites, 
it has to be agnostic. It can't depend on your chosen naming scheme, which suddenly your boss decides to change and then it's broken the website because the data API query fails now. So it's based on, so clearly you can change the table name, that's your own fault. Um, but essentially it's a, it works at a table level. Um, so at the very start of the process, you can say in this file, give me a thing called dollar metadata and it will just tell you every table, every field, what type of field it is, whether it's what type of field it is, whether it's uh, like a decimal or a, a text field, which fields are key fields, as in unique ID fields, uh, and a couple of other pieces of data. So a simple query, you can just go, tell me everything that, about this database file. And so then you have an object that you can start to pass through and work out, okay, well, therefore, I can write my own little stuff that says that's what the key field is called in that table. And therefore, it's that's what the surname is called. That's what the, you know, so Todd, who was a great one for, let me build my own tools in FileMaker to query stuff in FileMaker and do some other stuff with FileMaker. This is a starting path because it's like, here you go, here's a big object of everything about about the file and all queries after that are based on literally just a, a table and that's in there kind of re record and id level one of the other things that you mentioned in there which is probably on the list somewhere things to talk about my this seems like a like a decent segue is key fields very different yep. in the data api versus versus odata this is this is something we've been asking for for a long time one of the problems with the data API is in order to update a record, you need to have the file, the internal FileMaker record ID. Yeah, the row ID. You have to have, you have to have the row ID, not the, not the primary key. So what this leads to is this common pattern when you're building web apps or other, other things that work with FileMaker where you have to find the record in the database first with a find by, you know, your primary key field. Then you get back the row ID and then you use a row ID to then update the record you just you just found, which is this double request thing, which is inefficient and just feels feels nasty. The other the other my biggest complaint with that when the data API first came out is that REST really cares about this unique URL being being a unique thing at the other at the other end of the table. And that doesn't, it's not really true with the FileMaker Data API because the same record can potentially get different row IDs. Now it's a challenge you'd have to do like, if you did some kind of like data restore, like a, like a re-import of, uh, re of the records, you're getting new, new IDs. So that row ID is not an unchangeable, unique identifier of a record. It just isn't. It is it is FileMaker's internal row ID for that database as long as it has not been wiped out, you know, uh, as long as it hasn't been truncated and re-imported, it's, it's, it's safe. But that's the only case under which it's safe. And you just can't depend on that over the life of any, of any system. You need a unique ID from outside, from, you know, from other systems need to know that that customer has this ID in that system. And that, and that ID will never change. And so row ID wasn't that. And we had to do these workarounds and, and deal with it. Um, but now we have, uh, inside of OData, we have actually a better REST implementation, which is that the primary key is in the URL and it's correct. It is, it is actually the primary key. Yes, absolutely. And the, the interesting thing is the, if you go into a table setup, what what you would normally do to make a field your unique ID, as in it's it's something that has to be validated as unique, it has to not be modifiable, a couple of other key things. So the things that you would do to go, that's the primary key for this table. Um, so it can't it has to be unique because it can't be another one. Just by doing that, when you next query that same data with OData, it, it has automatically made the assumption now that that is in fact a key field. So if you're in the practice of 
as some people do for weird reasons, deciding that there are two fields that are in fact key fields on a record, um, then you might get a little confused by by that because yeah. it will go, oh, that's a that's a key field. Oh, that's a key field as well. I'm fine with that. I can have three. So I, I've done some tests where we have both a UID and a UID number in a table to test this out. So those are both unique and I flag them as unique. Both work as primary keys because OData oh says that's a primary key. I thought it picked the first one. No. Nope. That is, uh, what do I think about that? <laughs> On one hand, it's, it's sort of nice. On the other hand, it's sort of scary. <laughs> but, you know, I, well, if you think, I mean, I can think of where it might be nice to have that. I can think of some use cases where you maybe you don't want to expose the. Um, yes. You know, you, you may have a unique a unique primary key internal and you want some other kind of external thing to represent it. You know, from from some OData based system, a web page or some other system, you might want some other primary key. And so you don't need to that, you know, you could choose to use that field. But how does it so in OData, like how, how do you get the unique URL of a record? Is there a way like I don't remember seeing any query like that? Normally, you'd go, that's the primary key. Um, yeah, you can do the metadata query to go. Okay, here's 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 what it all is. Or you know that. Um, so, a tiny bit of a URL string might be forward slash person. Open brackets. Single speech mark. UID. Single speech mark. Close brackets. So that says, find me the person with that unique ID. That's the record I'm after in the URL. If, if there's only one, do you have to include the field name in the URL? Uh, yes, because you're saying... Oh, you do. Okay. Okay. You do need to do that. Okay. Yeah. So All right. the other... Let me just jump ahead for a second and a, a, a kind of weird little thought. This is right at the end. This is about logging. There's an OData log on your server for all of the, the queries that you make. If you do a GET query the URL string, which includes that unique ID, is logged in the log. If you do a post, you just get the fact there was a post was made. You don't get the data that you've posted. So that's one way to obscure from other people what you're doing is in fact. Uh, so if you run a script that contains a lot of stuff, uh, but therefore you post to the scripts table, you only log the fact you did a post. You don't log the right. data as well. So if somebody can get into your OData log, theoretically, there's a risk there because they can see the unique IDs of all of the people that you queried in the last yeah. five five months. That Again, uh, it's, your, it's your issue to deal with, but it's just a tiny little thing to be aware of. URLs are going to be visible um, for GET requests everywhere, like in, yeah. uh, inside the network tab of a browser, um, yep. inside, uh, all kinds of caching. I mean, get requests are cached anything. Um, they can, the, uh, yeah, anything in a get request can be cached and probably is cached by various layers of the internet. Uh, your browser on up to the many different, the CDNs and other data, data caching that's happening between between your machine and that server. So that that seems like that's just that's how the internet works. Post stuff isn't. Yeah. Yeah, this is it's a new thing and so just pointing out what some of the pitfalls are. So equally, we are we are equally bound within FileMaker by the length of the URL that we can use. It's different on different platforms, but basically 2000 characters. If you're trying to kind of do a, a get URL that's more than 2,000 characters, you probably ought to not be doing what you're doing is <laughs> the reality. I mean, I could see, I, I could see a very, like, like querying a couple of very wide tables 
where you want to list yeah. the specific field names you get back. So the way to, so let's just jump back to, oh, the way we manage it in the data API is we create a layout with just these fields in right. it. And so I query that layout. Oh, now I query the table. I don't want everything back. I just want these 10 fields back. So those right. field names I have to put in the string and it's like a dollar select equals this. Uh, just like a SQL query, right? Select yes. field field A, field comma, field B, field C, yes. et cetera. So if you are in the habit of creating very long field names <laughs> for your own esoteric purposes, suddenly you're typing in your or you're creating a URL which is two hundred characters longer than it needs to be. So there's a there's a like with why you shouldn't have a field name with a space in it because it will break a SQL calculation and you have to put speech marks around it. It's just a, okay, if you're doing this, then why don't you make sure that the field names you're querying are short because then you'll be able to query more of them if the URL <laughs> yeah. string length is, um, is somewhat restricted. That URL length, that's, that's imposed by the server, yeah? Uh, I think yes. So I read that. What I just quoted is out of the help. Okay. For optimal cross-platform use, limits the URL length length to two thousand characters. So that would be um, on Linux. The I think it's the web server, the nginx yep. on Linux, and I think nginx is on Mac now too. Uh, but Windows is still. Two is still two is. It wouldn't surprise me if Nginx is much bigger than two thousand, but I, I don't actually know that. Maybe, but but maybe if a listener can ping us, if you want to take the same thing and move the file to Windows Server temporarily because of la 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 la, and you want to move your code and your code yeah. breaks, it might break because of that reason. Yeah. So just be aware. It's a be aware kind of kind of thing. Data API, you get back a JSON object. Uh, OData, you can get back a JSON object or you can get back an XML object just by changing the header to an accept. Uh, it's accept uh, atom slash XML or accept application JSON. So you can get back XML if that floats your boat or is a requirement for something that will help you. Um, the first time you do a query, if you've forgotten to put that header in, you get XML back and you thought you go, I thought this was a JSON-based thing. And it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> Again, it's independent. Uh, XML is still valid. There's a couple of other, there's some clever little headers in there. You can get back a count of the records that you query so that you don't have to do a weird thing with your own custom function to work out how many things are in this array. You can just say, can I have a count with this as well? Um, the, the help is very good. There are a couple of things that are not supported. Uh, they're not things that are mostly going to concern kind of average programmers. Right. Um, so two, two areas that are worth kind of about some other things it can do. So simple case, here's a, here's a table, do a query on the whole table or do a query on specific record, get back this, choose this. Um, things like top work, so just give me the, the first five records back or you know th those kind of things. One of the things we love about Execute SQL in FileMaker is it allows us to get data from an unrelated table without having to put something on the relationship graph just to make that happen. So you yeah. can have a constants or a, some other table in which there is transient or intransient data stored. And you can just go, oh, just do a query. Find me this field from there because I need to use it right now. And I don't have to build a relationship to manage. It may or may not be inefficient, but it works. And we've all come to love that. Um, you can very simply uh, create your query in OData to query a related table using the FileMaker relationships. But there's a thing called a cross join, which is the equivalent of a SQL query saying, find me this data from this table where this thing is true and find it from here as well. Um, that will require a whole session almost certainly by itself about how to do that. 
But on the fly, you can build complex data queries. So it isn't just, oh, give me back this single record. You can build complex data queries using cross joins. Uh, if you kind of start to get to know what, uh, yeah, what to do. Um, again, I'll touch on that a bit in an auto enter live thing, and maybe later in the year I'll do something more extensive about it. But the data API, you have to predefine the relationships and the layouts that you need. Whereas with yes. O data, you can just do this as part of the query. You define what tables you want. You define what related tables you want. You define how they are joined together to produce the result set that you need. Yep. In our in our other um, podcast episode, we talked about multi files, and I've seen a file built specifically around the data API because of this need for relationships, tables, layouts, it, things being very very specific. And what you're saying here is that a lot of those limitations are going away. So, are are developers going to change the way they do development in order to fit what O data? data needs or does this actually make it simpler because what you probably have is probably okay that's a great question martha my my personal view is that i have changed the way i'm it's possible for me to develop because this tool is now in my toolbox so i can i can remember go back to when execute sql was first introduced and jason from c code produced that file for how to do it and we all used his file to start learning how to do it in filemaker okay but multiple conversations have said after that i changed the way i developed i could now do this i could now do this i think that more than the data api the odata opens the door to changing the way that we can work and once very specific way in which i am becoming practice. So we the last time Todd and I and you talked, we were talking about multiple files and the idea of a separation of process or separation of action or separation of function. That in my left hand, I have my file that I use. And in my right hand, I have some other file that I now can make something happen in this second file without having to have a single data reference from the first file to it because i can query it i can run a script i can get an answer back from it so it could be a calculation engine it could be an action engine it could be a queue to do various things and all i need in this second file apart from my dev user account is a single user account that has odata privileges so I no longer need to manage all of that stuff about, oh, there's a linked file over there. What happens when you, is it set to auto long with admin so that we don't get error messages? Or do we manage setting up accounts and managing it across two or three files? For me, this is becoming a massive way of opening a door to, I call it a machine file, but essentially it's, so there's a file in the middle here that can do some things. Not only that, that second file can operate on other files in the system that also don't need to have any reference. So I can operate right. on file three using file two as my machine to do it. It can operate on multiple files at the same time or in sequence. And all I need in both of those is literally just a single username and a password that has OTOS privileges. Now, I get that's like a bit at the edge of stuff, but just like the whole concept of how we started to look at some modular things, how we started yeah. to look at using card windows and other files, this opens a door, I think, to some new ways of de developing because that second or third file doesn't have to be on this server. It could be on a server in another part of the world, even if I can cope with the latency. It's definitely another way of decoupling, like which we've been talking yep. about a lot. Um, and uh, one of the one of the things that we're leaning on quite heavily is making more smaller things that work together in a, in a decoupled fashion. And you know, we we have our simple our simple queue tool, which does this to some degree. And now we've got now that ODAT is on all platforms, we have this as an option too. One thing I I think that we do do need to make clear, and this is something we've been saying actually for quite some time is that 
the center of innovation for FileMaker is the server, not the file. And it has been for a little while, but there's still there's still a sense for developers that they can just open up a file on their desktop and work uh, and not have a server involved. And once you go the OData route, that's definitely not true. If yeah, you're going to be using absolutely. OData to do, to do as, not as a way to get data in and out of FileMaker, but as a way to do work within a FileMaker system, you know, your file A calling file B with an insert from URL to, to do the OData stuff, you, that does not work unless you are on a server. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's fine. In fact, that's, that's how we do everything these days in, in general, uh, here, but it's still, if you've been doing FileMaker for a while, you know, it, it's kind of a hard habit to shake that you think you can just take your file down, open it up. It's going to work locally. Um, that's probably not true going forward. In fact, maybe someday there's, there's, you know, the files that we get down, are just data. <laughs> there's no like the <laughs> like, you know, just as like backups, but there's no like they don't actually do anything. And that's what we're headed for, I think, here. And I, I think that is okay, as I've said, but I do think people need to understand that's what they're doing. But they're adopting OData as a way to do this kind of decoupling. And it's I think it's a, a reasonable thing to look at. And there's other advantages too. There's another big one which we haven't gotten to yet, which we will, um, as to why OData as a way to do FileMaker scripting is interesting. Um, then you're you are now on a server, and that's that's it. You will always be on a server when you're doing development or when you're working on it in any way. Let's talk about the scripting stuff. What what is the impact on scripting? Well, it's kind of what John's saying about having these um, having these decoupled files. So you're using the FileMaker insert from URL script step to create a query and then execute that query using OData. You may the query may execute in the file you're in or it may execute in a different file or in several files. It could execute in, you know, potentially over multiple files because you're sending that request to the server. So, you, you know, one way to think about it, it's a little like PSOS. You're like, you're throwing at the server and the server's going to do it. So it has that benefit too, as it takes it out of the main UI thread that the user's dealing with. The server is now going to handle it. Um, and so you could do that. Now, the... What that means is you're now writing logic in basically URLs. You're making, um, you're creating URLs and you're creating JSON payloads to send around um, up, you know, up to the server. But really we're already sending JSON payloads all over the place. I mean, that's how we do everything really. Make a JSON um, string, pass it to a script, right? Now what we're saying is make a JSON payload, probably pass it to a script, which is set up already like our HTTP script to make the call directly. So you're actually moving more programming to JSON. That would be the sort of one way to summarize it if you choose to do this. Your programming becomes JSON based. The massive advantage of that move for me as well is then that ev everything is modified from data. So if you need to do this in a new or different file and or the server address moves, it's a single record in your, your configuration record in your first file just contains the server home URL and the table name and something else. If you want to change it, then you go and change those three bits of data and the script will then, everything else will then work in a new place. Yeah. So, so yeah. your mod and and the point about the JSON payload we've come to appreciate is you send everything you need in the JSON payload, and the thing the receiving thing deals with what you sent it. So if you have, I I have an action parameter always. What do I want to happen at the other end? And at the other end, receiving is a worker script, and the worker script says, oh, if it's save or if it's open or if it's send or if it's calculate or if it's whatever you send me so if i need a new action it's just changing get, giving a new word to the action parameter and two new lines in the at the other end so it makes modifying our coding so that the advantage of the modular approach is only modify it in one place just do it once over there and then let that ripple through the whole system so 
it's sort of getting to the point where we're stringing together several ideas, it feels. So, you know, Todd's thing about um, kind of separation, the whole ideas we've been talking about, about modular, um, the idea of separation of, uh, so UI can literally just be UI and not data. So you can secure that you can lock the data down. You know, the idea that when a customer says, I want to edit this record, then what you do is you do an o, uh, some data API query, a no data query, and it pulls the, that record from where it's stored into something temporary and global here. You modify it and say, click save, and it pushes it back, and it's no longer on your machine. So you don't have to worry about the fact your database is somehow stored on your machine because it's not. You know, yeah. the, the, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's a single killer answer but it begins to feel, yeah. I think, as Todd says, like it's a it's a start of a new way of programming that is clearly cloud first and friendly and yeah. cloud based. Yeah, server based, and also just the way the rest of the internet works. Yeah, these are all things that we're used to seeing on websites, right? This right. look at a thing, look at the data, be able to modify that data, but know that that's that's still temporal, right? It's not until I commit something or save it that that actually yeah. has an impact on the real data. And I think that in FileMaker. We tend to do, well, you know, we can do that, but it takes a, a, a bit of work to do that. It's not, it's not FileMaker's bread and butter, I would say, right? We kind of like the idea of being able to modify data as we go, and in some cases, it makes sense. Um, but what I'm what I'm hearing here is that we're just following the path that other other systems are already doing in the web. So it is very cloud first. It's, it's not a new concept. Definitely not a new concept, and it's you know, I haven't had enough experience doing this, um, with, with OData to to really understand. Uh, or just even have really a, a very good idea of where the trade-offs are. Cause there's trade-offs, right? Like, like yeah. the way that, the way that FileMaker works natively is pretty sweet for a certain set of use cases. Um, that, and those, you, and that, and those use cases were the majority of use cases for database applications 20 years ago. Um, they're, they're main, they may not be the majority anymore. And so that's where we're, you know that's kind of where we are right now. Is is where where is the trade off between the old way and the new way of doing doing FileMaker? The good news is you can certainly do both even within the same solution. This is not an all or nothing thing. Yeah, the issue with is when uh, Claris give us a new tool, uh, as you know, if I give you a new hammer, then every problem starts to look like the nail <laughs> that that hammer works with. So. Yeah. We discovered quite quickly that using execute SQL in tooltips was a really bad idea because it hit performance yeah. terribly, terribly. So just because it's there, uh, our job is to go, here's something new in our toolbox. Now, our, my job, your job is to kind of go, here's some ways that you could use this. Let's see if that's useful for you, but start thinking outside your own box about what could be possible. Um, and yes, maybe there's a little trade-off here and a little trade-off there, but actually you get this thing instead. Um, but it's not for everything and it's not for everyone. I'm not suggesting yeah. that either, but definitely don't want people to sit there and go, oh, I don't understand it, so I won't touch it. And in three years' time, you sit next to somebody in a conference who says, oh, you yeah, know, I've never touched OData at all. I'm enough of an enthusiast to want people to pick up the new hammers and see what it, what nails it will work with. We, we should probably um, make sure we cover, if we're going to talk about FileMaker logic using OData, we probably need to cover the other big giant feature that OData has. Um, so John, you want to talk about the batching feature a little bit? Yes. So, so headline, Todd is going to be happy because O data can be transactional. Okay. <laughs> that's Todd, that's all you need to know. Go and sit in the corner. <laughs> um, so in this, so we we know if you are used to writing a multi-part email, you have multiple, you kind of go, here's a boundary, and then here's the plain text part, and here's the HTML part. And here's the attachments part, and here's the inline image part. Okay, that concept works here. So instead of just doing 
a single thing. Uh, you, it's a, it becomes a post where you post a body, and the body is created with multiple sequential requests. Um, in fact, uh, it works slightly differently. Not time to kind of explain the mechanics again. I think we'll kind of get to show some of it. But essentially, you go, here's a boundary. Here's a load of things inside that boundary that I'd like you to do. Um, and you go, go off, go and do that. Thank you very much. Um, it's transactional in that, well, you have a choice, to be fair. There's an option that says, if any of these fail, then just continue anyway. And you can that's an option you can set. But if you want it to be transactional, you clearly don't do that. If any part of that transaction fails, if any of those steps fail, the whole thing thing is transactional in that the whole thing will be wound back and not committed. Okay, so at that level, it is transactional. Now, what you get back is not a helpful JSON object. What you get back is the equivalent of a kind of text headers response that we're going to have to learn how to parse what did happen, how many things were a yes. It's not as simple as it first seems. But it does work. But the big caveat is, and it's in the help, you don't get access to anything from the previous step. Yeah. So if you create record A, and as part of creating record A in a transaction, that generates a unique ID, and the, your second step in the transaction is to use that as a parent ID in the next record, you don't get to know what that created unique ID in the first thing was. Now, there is clearly a way to do it, which is you pre-generate all of your unique IDs and send them across. So you say, if this is going to work, parent record one will have this parent ID. Records two, three, and four will have this as their sort of child ID to the other unique ID. That, that makes it not quite as slick as a proper transaction. We've been promised that some other real stuff may be happening on transactions soon, but it absolutely does work. The issue, I would say, on one level is you might have to write um, something that is a much bigger payload just to be able to do a couple of simple things because you have to put all the boundary around it and you have to put what it's doing. You may end up writing a massive payload to do a simple task. That's probably not quite as efficient as you really wanted, um, but it does work. But that kind of, you know, that that a crafting of that payload is something you're, you're going to have a script API for, yes. where you're going to be able to build up that, you know, um, so you're eventually just going to be creating the steps that you need. And once you have that framework for building that, that seems that seems pretty doable. You know, like we have this HTTP script, which manages all the construction of the of the curl commands. And we, we, we could just as easily have one. Well, we shouldn't say just as easily, but we'll, I'm sure, have an OData flat flavor of that to be able to handle yep. handle these kinds of things. So that doesn't seem to bother me. And the unique ID thing doesn't bother me because we've been using UUIDs. But it does mean that if you have serial numbers for your primary keys, you're just out of luck. You can't. You cannot use yeah, transactions if you have serial numbers. You probably shouldn't be doing that in the first place anyway. So Yeah. Yeah, probably. But there's there might be there's there may be other cases where you it may not just be primary keys, but you may need to create a record, it does some kind of auto enter calculation, and then based on what you get back from that, you're gonna use that in the next in the next in the next records. And you can't do that. Now that is also very, quite commonly the case when you're doing scripted transactions currently with the current FileMaker transaction engine as it is, is that you don't get access to all like lookups and auto enter calcs yeah. when you're yeah. moving on to the next record. So this is something I, I call, this does also lead to the, um, to the size of the payload and the, the amount of work you have to do up front. I call it pre-work. Like you're not going to be able to rely on the like let's say you you're generating an invoice so you have an invoice header and five line items and you want 
also the total of the line items. Well, you, you're not going to get that from the FileMaker database engine because you will not have been able to commit all the records and it won't have totals and you won't be able to get, yep. the, get that summary back. So you have to actually manage, if you need the total, you actually have to manage pre-calculating the total amount yourself in whatever, you know, using scripted logic or some other way to do that. And that's an example of what I call pre-work. And that does come up with the scripted API. That, I mean, the FileMaker scripted transactions that we've been doing for, you know, more than a decade now. So this isn't necessarily a new concept. It's just something you definitely have to be aware of. That you're not going to get access to the stuff that is in flight. In fact, you get you do get less access to the stuff that's in flight because in the at least in the case of the scripted transactions, um, as long as it's not new records, uh, and you haven't, um, uh, well, yeah, anything that anything that is edited, you can get access to new records. You can't in the scripted stuff typically, but new records or edited records are are within are within your space in the FileMaker script that you can reach out and get data later on down the, you know, down your transaction script. And that just won't be the case at all. In this case, you have no, yeah. you have no representation of what was edited in the previous step. When you get to the next step, you're just everything that you need from that step. You have to have figured out a way to pre-calculate it. One, one of the issues is that we tend to talk about transactions as create new record, create, new child record, create new child record, create new child record. And actually a transaction could be, here's 10 records, modify all 10 of them, change the status of all 10 to this. It doesn't, it's not about just record creation. So as a, for example, if, uh, if an OData batch uh, is transactional, it means if one of the records that you're trying to modify the status on is locked by another user, it will quite rightly fail in the same way that you really would expect it to fail. Yeah. So it gives you, you know, it gives you the transactional mentality to be able to kind of go, Hey, in, in this circumstance. So in the case of a student system where you want to update the status of all the students who've just finished a module, to passed or to whatever the status should be passed or failed. Um, that would be a batch. You'd write something that said, find all the records that have this, um, this module ID in this particular academic year at this particular time, and just go and update the status to this. So you can write a batch to do that. If a colleague uh, has a record open, you want that to fail and you want to know it's failed and come back and do it later. Yeah. And those, those are things like, you know, there are lots of cases where updating a status or something like that, it's fine if one fails. You may need to know it, that it fails. But um, in other cases, it's absolutely critical that that all of them go through, right? Especially anytime there's math involved, you're almost certainly going to need to make sure that the entire batch go, the entire batch goes through. Yeah, yeah. This is pretty awesome. I think what, to me, what I'm, what I need to figure out is what are the ergonomics of actually programming in this way within the FileMaker because, you know, within FileMaker scripting, like if I'm going to be writing JavaScript, which I write a lot for the web page stuff that we do and the API stuff that we do, um, this is going to be great because I've got, especially if I get type safety and all that kind of stuff, which I can get from these yeah. modern tools, that means my type ahead is going to be ridiculously good for doing all, the, for doing all this, for doing all this kind of coding. We're not going to get any hints like that um, uh, inside of FileMaker for building these JSON objects. Uh, so I'm just, I just, that's what I don't have a sense for is how, is how ergonomic is this um, when you're actually writing code? Uh, is it, is it, it's, um, is it good enough that it, it actually provides benefits or is it, or is it kind of a struggle? It's the same as if you're sitting there with an API manual working out how to make a call to X, yeah. MailChimp, Twilio, you're reading the manual going, this has to be a get. I know what the first part of the URL is. Here's the last part of the URL. Here's what I need to do in that case in the JSON body or whatever. So there's two manuals. Uh, one is what am I trying to do? One's the, the Claris O data manual going, how do I, how, just how do I write this? And once you've learned how to do that a few times, 
you know, however you choose to abstract it, do you do you use mustache format like it is in Postman so that you can just do a substitute, or do you write yeah. it out longhand? And then there are the parameters you put on. So you know perfectly well how to put question mark, dollar something equals this, dollar something equal, and dollar something equals that. It's that. It's the stuff that you've been doing for 10 years, ultimately. Um, the auth is um, a base64 encode username colon password. Yeah. Um, and so you have, a, you have a URL, you have an options variable. Um, you might have a data payload sometimes that you're going to refer to in a, with a, through a dollar variable. It's the same. It's Because it is just web based stuff so in filemaker yeah. no friction if you're used to doing this outside you've got methods of doing it it would be really easy to transfer the skills that you already have to i just it's that query i need to follow the query from the manual oh there you go it works thank you very much yeah i think i think the you know for when you're doing filemaker scripting and calc you do get some type ahead stuff that, that it's helpful um, in terms of like you get your field names, et cetera, or type of heads. Um, and, and they're also stored as a field reference. So they, when you start doing, when you start doing this, this kind of programming within FileMaker, um, building, building essentially URLs and JSON objects, you don't get any of that. And not only that, it's now text. So you don't have any references. So you have to be careful about um, things like field name changes and stuff like that. There's no, there's no protection against it. So that's the challenge I'm thinking of. Is like, is like, okay, we have function. We did this for execute SQL. Like, it's not, it's not a new problem. So it's not that it's a new problem. The question is, if I'm contemplating like shifting, if I'm contemplating shifting complex transactional logic from, from, from FileMaker scripting engine to OData. Um, what's, you know, what is that, you know, what are the impacts from, from, from these kinds of things? I, ha I end up having to do a lot of protection where I'm getting field names from field references and doing all that stuff. Yeah. And so how does, how does that pan out in terms of, of how quickly it is to build something? What, is, what's the, the, the DX of it or the, the experience of building it? And I, I don't know what that is yet. Um, hopefully we'll get some good abstractions that'll make it easier. I, I think those 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 issues still apply. If you change a table name, yeah. then clearly you've changed the table name. So either don't do it or write your code in such a way that it protects you from doing it. Those are the two answers. Uh, again, like you say, we've been doing it for a while. If, if you want yeah, stuff yeah. to be not, really yeah. safe, then it ends up with extra boilerplate code. Um, you're going to get to a point quite quickly where you've got a snippets script in which you're copy and pasting some basic boilerplate into there to create this query and then you've got your http script it'll just actually do the query um contemplating shifting more logic it's this does does doing all that stuff scale like um is that become you know because we're saying you know it's fine if it's like i need to do some execute sql because there's no other way to do this easily in filemaker so i come up with with a way to do it, it's a rare event, right? Or it's an, it's not the main line for doing FileMaker Pro development. Yeah. And if OData is the main line of FileMaker Pro development for your main business logic, how does that feel? I guess is that that's maybe the way to summarize it. And I don't know yet because I haven't really tried. There'll be some abstractions, some custom functions, and patterns that will evolve to make that easier. But I think it's just worth saying that. It is, you do have to be aware of these things. So just like deciding to start tomorrow to rewrite your system using OData <laughs> um, is probably <laughs> like slow down, like absorb what these changes are going to bring to you, especially when it comes to long, the long-term maintenance of a, of a project, right? Um, it's, you just don't want to run out and, and just adopt something willy-nilly without understanding what, what Roblox, you, what Roblox are you putting, you know? somewhere down the road, I guess is the way to say it. Yeah, I think that, I think that, you know, we, we, we have been talking a lot about modern FileMaker revolution, and this is a good example of taking something that exists out there, bringing it into FileMaker, 
and it introduces new things to think about. But in the end, it just opens up what we've got available to us, right? And so yeah. more choices to make, but we want that, right? Otherwise, we're going to get stale. And so it's it's <laughs> it's pretty cool that we get to move forward with it and and get to see where the benefits are big enough that we're going to take advantage of them. I was just going to say, like, so, we, so we've been talking for a little bit about the nitty gritty of doing, uh, of using OData as sort of the main, you know, logic part of a FileMaker system where you are calling from FileMaker to FileMaker, you know, using insert from URL to call the OData API in another FileMaker database. And that is, so that's what we're talking about, these, 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 these kinds of trade-offs and things. But it's, I just, I just would be remiss if I didn't mention that if you're doing web development um, uh, and you've got, especially if it's Microsoft-based web development, even better for you because OData libraries exist for this and they're great. They're going to handle a lot of this complexity for you. You're not going to be having to, having to create a lot of things in strings. You're going to use the idiomatic patterns for whatever framework you're using. I'm most familiar with, with the JavaScript ecosystem where there are where there are OData clients that will handle this, and so you're just doing standard JavaScript, and even better, there's TypeScript um, OData clients, which means I get all this amazing type ahead stuff within my IDE, and it protects me against things like field name changes because it will tell me exactly what fields are no longer correct. So there, so w when you're when you're outside of FileMaker, OData is, doesn't have any of these any of these th th these weird issues. Because the, the 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 tooling that's there is all designed to to handle it. Inside of FileMaker, we don't have that same tooling. So I just wanted to make that clear. We can build that a little bit. So for example, uh, if you do a metadata query and look yeah. in a certain place for a field called a certain thing, and that field doesn't exist, that's the point at which you throw an error message and don't carry on working. That's right. You say something after this point is now broken. Now, we've never really been able to do that before uh, on another file. So I can yeah. do it using, you know, I can use the Andrew Duncan's things where it's like, here you go, you can query the base tables using execute SQL to see if the field names are all there. I can do that in this file. With OData, I can do it in another file I want to work on. I can do it in this file, but I can do it in another file I can also check. Um, so before Martha makes us go away and have tea or whatever, <laughs> a couple of, couple of really quick things to just kind of tag on as well. I don't want to. One is if you are using this on FileMaker Cloud, the authentication oh, yeah. thing is a little more, a little bit more difficult because it uses Amazon's Cognito and there's a bunch of really complicated workarounds to get. Uh, the token, as opposed to the fact that it's just basic auth, it's using an X dash token in the header. That's a whole yeah. separate bag of worms. Typ <laughs> um, typical uh, <laughs> AWS Cognito nightmares, really. There, it's not unusual, but it's it's really it's really surprising. Like I hear people in other communities talk about about using Cognito, and they love it because they've been through it enough, so they know exactly what to do. But it's unlike any other type of auth. <laughs> yeah, it's very don't. it's very much its own thing and it's nasty so there are some limitations to what type of data binary data you can upload and download from containers it's basically limited yeah. to pdfs and image files so you can't be using this with excel and word files that's a limitation the great thing is that this is one of those places where in, look at the stuff that Brad's been talking about for a while. If you said to some other Microsoft developer, here is the URL of my file. You can use OData with it. Here's the documentation for what isn't supported. Somebody else can just talk to your data straight away. Yeah. This is opening the door into places where there are people who've been working with this data for five, 10 years and have skill sets that we don't even have. And if you just go, there you That's go, right. so data. Oh, yeah, I don't have to explain to you about. So uh, previously, you could go, oh, it works with PHP. Here's the here's the endpoint. Here's what you need. Here's what's supported. Here's the documentation. Now it's just OData. If you know OData, you know how to construct the query. You know that you're going to get this, you're going to get this. And the final thing is that big headline thing, 
is that OData can modify the schema. That's right. It's a totally separate conversation, but you can add tables and you can add fields to your schema using OData. I have done as a practical proper exercise, I get an XML file from the government, which contains uh, a load of fields and what the valid values are. I have written a script that can take that XML file into a brand new table, create the fields that I need. I need a field called code underscore this value and this value, and then go through the, the data and extract into records the code and the value and just build itself from scratch. Yeah. Now, we've never had the opportunity to do that pro programmatically before. No, Big I mean, thing. we could do it with like the base elements plug it with some plugins and things, but, but not, I think ODBC actually let us do this too, would also let you modify stuff. But what you said at the beginning was think this is ODBC for the web. So of course right. it will do That's it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but just to make sure people, people get same limitations that apply to ODBC here is you're not going to be creating file maker calc fields or summary fields, right? You are, no. you are creating, you are creating standard the standard Tech, FileMaker data type. String, string, yeah. numeric, um, you can create a container field, but yes, you're creating raw yeah. native types. Yeah. But for the purpose, the purpose in hand, the fact that that works, oh, clearly I had to do a bit of programming. What it means is if they send me a new file, I just open up this file, create a new table and go, I'll just put that on there. There you go. Thank you very much. Come back in a while. I know that, so if they've removed a field, it doesn't get created a new version of the file, then I've yeah. got all the records. It, again, it's an edge case, but it's properly there. And um, therefore, caveat, you can break your system really quite quickly because as well as creating, <laughs> you, can, you can delete stuff with yeah, OData. Putting an entire table. <laughs> yes. This is exactly please. how we want to end the podcast, right? Like, hey, please by the way, you might just break everything. <laughs> please do not put this in the hands of a junior developer. I think we should maybe lean on that just for a second. Um, if you're, again, uh, you know, the caution against just jumping into something like, I'm going to do all my FileMaker programming in OData, recognize that if you don't set your security schema up quite well, drop table yep. is an option that you could send to that database. So when you're setting up that username and account, you should be very careful about the privilege sets that are the, the privileges that you are enabling yeah. um, uh, on that on that account so that those kinds of things don't happen, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do not come after me just because I told you it was possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, John, one of my yeah. first memories of you is sitting at a DevCon in the hallway and you were showing me a, a, a demo file or a file you've been playing with for, with card windows, I think. And so I think the thing we need to remember here is be like John, always create demo files and play there, right? Don't play with the real stuff just yet. So, <laughs> no, no, no. So that'll no. be the, no, no. that'll be the, the, the thing we'll walk away with today. Now, if you do, if you do that stuff where you write the code and you test it and you test it to your own satisfaction that it's bulletproof, then you can literally pick this stuff up and copy and paste it into somewhere else. So I have things that are already in and using OData that are production ready that I can, any new client that comes, if they need this, I can just pick it up and put it in. That's the modular goal, isn't it? Of kind of, That's yeah, pretty fantastic. It is. Yeah. Tech, so. I think what is obvious is that there's another conversation to be had, if not three more. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's more. Lots. It will be Todd asking me a bunch of questions because he's been often played with it. And saying, oh, why doesn't <laughs> why doesn't this work? And a bit of and a bit of kind of user testing with lo uh, load. Yeah, um, yeah, load testing is the other one that's that's really critical because we lean on the data API quite heavily now. Um, and so understanding what are going to be the reasons to drive us to move um, are are important. Now, data one thing about the, I should say this: the one thing about the data API is that perform execute data API works on the data, the script step, perform execute data API works on, on the FileMaker client and it does not work with OData and it's, it's unlikely to work. OData is a yeah. server based yeah. feature. Whereas actually for whatever reason, I don't know why some reason in the code that this was needed to be. So the data API, the code that executes it and generate does all the stuff is actually in the client which is why we can get a script step that executes it 
on the client and why we can't and and the odata one being on the server is why we cannot get one of those for uh because it's on it's server only so so the the only other thing i haven't in my notes i haven't covered is it is possible so you know the issue with json payloads and long numbers yes it is possible it is possible to get to force odata to give you back so the the result of a get UIDN number is very long, 40 odd characters. Um, you can force OData to give you that back in the JSON body as a proper number of that length, not as a string. The only problem is that JSON get element will break when you try and extract it. But you can get the data back not in exponential format. Um, again, I think I'll go into that in a bit more detail because essentially you have to grab some outer object and do some text parsing to protect it. Um, so there, there are functions like in SQL. There are functions you can apply to do transformations and things on the data as part of the request. Yeah, so, yeah. something like that. There's a little as ever. It's great talking to you. Just you know, chewing yeah. good and so good. really fun talking. Uh, I was looking forward to this and getting all this getting all this information so I, I don't have to I don't have to go learn it all myself. So thank you, John. Yes, exactly. <laughs> thank you, John, for taking this on. This is really important actually. This is a big new feature and it's it's wide ranging in its impacts and potential benefits and trade offs and pitfalls. So having people that get interested and take the deep dive to really lay it out is, is so important. And that's, you know, that's why why we have this podcast is to is to disseminate this. So, so thanks for being, for for okay. for coming on and sharing this stuff with us. Yeah, Love thank it. you. We look forward to your presentation on at Auto Enter Live, and I'm sure there are other conferences where you'll be there too. So, we will keep up with all the good stuff you do. July 19th to 20th for Auto Enter Live. 19th and 20th, Auto yeah. Enter. Two days, awesome. two days of lots of awesome content by all by yeah. the community. It's gonna be really exciting. Yeah. All right. Looking forward well, to that. Well, thank you both. Okay, everybody. Until the thanks next so time. much. Thank all right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Just as a reminder, this is available on YouTube and as a podcast, and make sure you check out the show notes as there are a lot of links to share there. If you can take a minute to pause and subscribe, we'd really appreciate it, but better yet, if you can share it with a friend, that would be pretty awesome. No matter what your role is in this community, you're proof of how amazing this Claris community really is. My job is to help spread your knowledge and your stories on the podcast. Find me on Twitter at MZ123 or at ProofGeist, and let's share your story.